Well, hello everybody. This is our open access update for 2017. My name is Lauren Cadwallander and I work in the Office of Scholarly Communications. I've been working in the open access for publication team for almost uh, three years now, uh, but actually I'm switching over to the research data team, so I'm still happy to answer any open access questions, but uh, my focus will be changed from data from now on. We've got a, a chat box at the bottom right hand side of your screen. If you've got any questions as we go along, please put them in there. Claire will put me in the ribs and I'll do my best to answer your questions. So today's webinar, uh, we're going to look at the changes to the open access policy landscape. Uh, we're going to look at the, the changes to open access in Cambridge and think about what the future might hold for open access. So first of all, we're going to look at the open access policy landscape here in the UK. And the first a uh, bit of news I'm going to talk to you about is the RCUK policy. So RCUK are made up of seven different funders. They're listed down at, down at the bottom for you. And they started their open access policy almost five years ago. This was a transitional policy to see how, how open access really worked out for the RCUK. And it's due to end on the 31st of March 2018. They recently made a grant analysis of years two and three available at the, the web link there. And year four will become available soon. I think they're just tidying up the data now. Unfortunately, they didn't collect any data in year one. Um, not such great research data management there, but we'll forgive them. Um, so that's quite an interesting read. You can look at how the APC price has changed and the number of papers that have been made open access has changed over the years as researchers and institutions have gotten to grips with their policy. Now, with the end of the five-year transition, we've all been waited, waiting with bated breath to find out what happens next. Uh, we were told to expect a positive announcement in mid-July, and actually that positive announcement came at five minutes, oh, sorry, four minutes to five last night, so I haven't had a chance to update my slides, unfortunately. Uh, but they have um, said that there will be a further two years of funding for open access. So the RCUK policy won't be changing, the kind of service will be continuing as normal for RCUK funded researchers over the next couple of years. Uh, Claire's just put a, a link down in the chat box to the kind of FAQs that they released yesterday in relation to the kind of extension of that two years. Now the other thing to bear in mind with RCUK is that actually things are changing at a governmental level as well. So Research Councils UK are merging with Innovate UK and also HEFKE. So uh, HEFKE have their own open access policy to do with REF compliance. And they're actually becoming the UK Research and Innovation, so UKRI, and that will be created from April 2018. Uh, they haven't got an exciting logo yet, so my uh, graphic on the, on the left-hand side isn't too exciting on the bottom, the bottom side. Um, but really, we don't know what this is going to mean in terms of open access. We do know, you know that the RCUK policy is now continuing for the next two years, but we might see some kind of alignment between HEFKE and Research Capital UK policy. Perhaps not. We're, we're ever optimistic. But that is really something we're, we're going to find out about, I guess, at a later date. The second kind of open access policy that I wanted to update you about was the Wellcome Trusts. So they haven't changed their policy, but they have introduced what's called a whitelist. So this was introduced on the 1st of April this year, and it's uh, a list of publishers that comply with the Wellcome Trust requirements. So they've set out an uh, extra set of requirements that they would like publishers to meet, and so they've produced this whitelist that names all those publishers who have agreed to those services. So those services are that the publishers will deposit into Europe PMC on behalf of the authors, that they must offer a CC BY license and make it clear that this is the license required by the Wellcome Trust. They have to issue an invoice with useful details on it for when we pay an APC. Um, you might think that sounds a bit trivial, but we receive, or we have received, lots of invoices in the past that just say manuscript $5,000, and that's all the information we ever have about the paper. So actually that's really useful for us in terms of processing APC payments and they must have a re the publisher must have a refund policy so that if they give the paper the wrong license we're entitled to ask for our money back and that there is a process in place for that. So the Welcome Trust recommend 
We use a tool called Sherpa Fact in order to check whether the publisher is compliant. They're kind of hidden their whitelist on their website somewhere. Um, so, they, but they recommend the Sherpa Fact tool to check that publishers do comply. And all you do is simply with Sherpa Fact is to go to their website. You pick a journal from the list, or you type it in. You pick your funders. You press go, and you get a page like this. So you're basically looking for a green tick, and that means that the the paper can comply if you publish that journal. So if you see it on the left hand side there, you're just looking for green ticks. If you see big red crosses, that means that the publisher does not offer a Wellcome Trust compliant option and that you shouldn't be publishing in there if you're Wellcome Trust funded. The next publisher and their open access policy I just wanted to mention was the Gates Foundation. Now, we don't come across this funder very often, but we do occasionally, and some of, some of you may know researchers who have Gates Foundation funding. They're a bit like the Wellcome Trust in that they require gold open access. And they've actually set up a dedicated platform to deal with the gold open access payments. So if we come across any Gates Foundation funded researchers, we simply direct them to this Kronos platform. They can enter all the details about their paper there and request for their APCs to be paid. Now it's important to note that this does not apply to Gates scholars. So it gets a bit confusing with all the kind of Gates trusts and Gates Foundation and Gates scholars out there, but really Gates Foundation is just specifically for people who are acknowledging Gates Foundation funding, not Gates scholars or Cambridge Trust or anything like that. So moving on, uh, next I want to talk about Open Access at Cambridge. So you may have noticed that our website at uh, openaccess.can.ac.uk has changed recently. Uh, it hasn't changed by much, it still looks quite similar to the old system, but we've changed it to reflect our switch over to symplectic elements as our upload system. So we switched to the new upload system from the 1st of June. We had been trialling it with uh, several pilot departments from kind of late last year. And now all uploads go, go via symplectic elements. And there are lots of benefits. So just briefly, I thought I'd explain symplectic elements for those of you who are not too familiar with it. It's the university's research information management system. So it really is there to store and contain all the information about researchers and their activities. So of course things like publications, professional activities, grants, teaching activities. And it's an internal system, so people in Cambridge can see it, but it's not externally facing. So if you kind of Googled someone, you'd never find their Symplectic Elements account. And it works in a number of different ways and a number of different um, parts of the university feed into it. So the grants will be fed in um, from the Research Information Office. The publications are picked up automatically from things like Web of Science and Scopus. And then professional activities, teaching activities can be added by researchers themselves or maybe an administrator in their department. And symplectic elements can actually be used to upload loads of different output types. Um, I'm really talking about journal articles and conference proceedings today because this is an open access webinar, but actually it can be used to upload anything a researcher wants from data sets to book chapters to things like software and code or a thesis or conference post or that kind of thing. So if any of you are researching librarians and you have any outputs you'd like to share whether they're published or kind of more grey literature you're also welcome to share them via symplectic elements and they will be put into our repository Apollo. So I said there were lots of benefits of symplectic elements um, and there are. <laughs> there are benefits for, for researchers, and there are benefits for administrators, there are benefits for our service. So as I was saying, it links to Apollo. So this is one of the great benefits, I think, for everybody, in that Symplectic Elements is now integrated to Apollo, the repository. So that means once an author uploads a paper to Symplectic, it can be put into the repository very quickly, uh, which is great for us because it's less manual work. But it's also great for the author because it increases the visibility of their research because it becomes uh, available by search engine like Google in a, in a lot quicker time. It was taking us kind of about three months to upload a paper that someone had sent us, but now as soon as we process that paper, we can put it, we can make it available in Apollo. It also means that it avoids duplication of people sending us their paper twice. Um, in the old system, 
an author could send us their paper and their co-author could also upload it to us, kind of not knowing that it would have been sent to us. And we'll avoid that in symplectic elements because when you upload the paper, you'll specify all the authors. And so it kind of tag all the other Cambridge authors to that paper. Links to grants can be made really easily. So as I was saying, grants information is already fed in from the Research Information Office. So researchers or whoever's uploading the paper can simply just say, this paper is linked to this grant. And then that's really useful because when it comes to grant reporting time, we already have that information that this grant produced these, these uh, papers or data sets or, or whatever the output happens to be. Uh, we can mean instant DOI. So this is a really a great benefit for data. So uh, if you want a DOI for your data and you want to put it in your publication, as soon as you upload your data set to the repository or to Symplectic, sorry, it will create a DOI and you'll get an email back pretty soon afterwards with that DOI, which you can then go and use. And we could also do that for placeholders. So if you want that DOI, but your data is not quite final, we can issue uh, a kind of placeholder record with a DOI that won't change so that you can go off and put that DOI in your publication and come back and make your uh, record of your data kind of final. So there are better reporting capabilities, which is really helpful for departments and for us as well. So we can monitor things like open access, access compliance and see who's doing what and, and where we might need to address any shortfalls. It can be linked to ORCID IDs uh, and then you can enable ORCID to speak to data site who mint our DOIs. So if you're putting in your uh, outputs via symplectic elements and Apollo and you're, they're getting assigned DOIs, they can then automatically be pushed into your ORCID record as well. You should also be getting the same great service that you always have done from our open access team. I would admit that we've got a bit of a backlog at the moment from the kind of earlier in the year from the first of April. We got a huge surge in the number of people sending us stuff because they were reminded about the hefty policy. Uh, and we haven't quite got to grips with that backlog yet. People are very um, very good at sending us their, their outputs at the moment. So we're still trying to keep on top of things, but we'll do our best to, to um, process things in a timely manner, especially if people let us know that they're urgent. Um, and it's one of those things that once you send us your paper, you only have to do it once, and it's used in many of those systems like I was talking about, all kids, grants funding, that kind of thing. So if you need any guidance on how to use symplectic elements for open access uploads, uh, you can go to the openaccess.cam.ac.uk pages and we've got a list of FAQs. Uh, if you go to the section depositing articles via symplectic elements, you'll even find some videos narrated by myself and uh, some step-by-step -step instructions if you're sick of the sound of my voice. If you have problems accessing elements, you'll need to email researchinformation at admin.cam.ac.uk. Elements is set up for researchers and researchers all automatically have a profile and they have access. So you might find that you can't get onto elements because you're not classed as a researcher but a librarian. If you are researching and you have outputs you want to use, then that's great. Uh, you just need to drop the research information officer line and let them know that and they can set you up with a profile. And they can also give you access if you need to deposit on behalf of the researchers in your department or your college. So moving on to open access uh, updates at Cambridge, um, I'm going to talk about big deals. So this, these big deals are to do with the subscriptions for journals and also the open access. So journals are kind of moving their subscription deals away from just subscription to the journal, but often incorporating subscriptions and open access um, kind of fees together. And so there are a few big deals that have been and the ones that are coming up. So most recently, we kind of completed the deal with the Royal Society of Chemistry. There was a town hall meeting that we hosted about this earlier in the year where researchers and librarians and administrators or, and whoever else wanted to come along got to express their views about which deal we should take. In the end, we decided to go for option three. Um, so this means that we get a 15% discount on all article processing charges for open access. We'll be subscribing to all new titles. Uh, and this is a three-year deal. There are a couple of other big deals on the horizon. So, um, namely with Wiley and Taylor and Francis, they're due for renewal um, at the end of the calendar year. 
These are being negotiated by JISC. Um, and we were sent kind of initial drafts about what we would like to, to see in the deal. And so we were able to comment on those and send those back and then just get taking those into account with the deals. Fortunately, there's no more information on how those deals are going at the moment. We just sit and wait for JISC to come back to us. But we'll see what they say. So, you may uh, or may not be aware that when we signed the Elsevier, Elsevier deal at the end of last year, there was um, a, uh, there were many researchers and librarians who were a bit annoyed that we just signed the deal without kind of having a plan B in place. Um, that we really got to the point where we didn't have an alternative, so we just signed, and they felt that it wasn't a very good deal for us. So uh, the general coordination scheme has put together a working group that has representatives from across the different schools, um, including researchers, as well as people like the heads of schools and more senior members of, of staff. Um, and they're really going to work on what, what the plan B could be and what really is best for the university. So I'm sure you're going, so what is your plan B? Well, when, when I asked my colleague what, what the uh, plan was, he said, there are no details as yet. Um, but, and I'm glad to hear there is a but, there, there has been discussion nationally about what could be a plan B. So I've kind of put the plan B ideas into the future section uh, because it's not quite a plan B as yet and it's something that we are looking into as kind of a future way that open access is going. So the future of open access um, might use completely kind of go on a slightly different track, I suppose. And that's using something like OA button, so open access button, as part of an interlibrary loan system. So open access button is a service where you can enter uh, some information about the article that you're after, so a DOI or the title or the citation, and it'll go and it'll search um, across various repositories for an open access version of the paper. So the idea of this kind of plan B is that it could be linked up to an interlibrary loan system so that you're trying to access a paper from a journal that we no longer have a subscription to. You can't access that paper. And so you use something like OA button and then you find a library that has a copy of that paper that you could access and that you try and access it through a kind of interlibrary loan system. How that actually works is uh, the details of that are being kind of thrashed out a little bit, whether they could just send you an electronic copy or whether they'd have to download the article and print it out and send it to you in the post, which seems a little silly. Um, they're you know, still working around what they could do, what would be legal, uh, and that kind of thing. So if you go to open access button and you stick in a DOI of a, of a paper you're trying to find, this is what happens. It says it's searching thousands of repositories for you. Just give them a moment and it kind of thinks about it for a bit. And then it tells you, hooray, this article is available. Or it might say, you know, it can't find a copy of this article. And then it will give you a link to click on to go and find that paper. And if you click on that link, you'll get something like an accepted manuscript. So this is one of my papers that I tried out that's in the Cambridge repository. So I had to go to see if it worked. And I'm pleased to say it did. So with the idea of this, it's, you know, it's really pushing for green open access and for people getting copies of their manuscripts in repositories. And then it's searching across thousands of repositories um, and using aggregators to try and find a copy of, of that manuscript. There is a kind of an alternative to OA button which I thought I'd put in here because actually these tools are just quite useful for trying to find open access content anyway uh, and sometimes some work better for, for some journals and papers and others work better for others. So the alternative to uh, OA button is something called Unpaywall. It was um, designed and created by a couple of researchers who are really big in the open access field and who are doing some really cool stuff. Um, and they also created Impact Story if you're familiar with that. Um, it's pretty much runs on the same principles as Open OA Button, but it's trying to find a legal open access version of your paper from something like a repository. Um, I, so I tested this out with the same paper that I used on OA Button, and I didn't actually have much luck, unfortunately. So 
This is the paper I was trying to find an open access version of. So you can see it costs £36. Uh, pounds, so it's probably not worth it. Uh, if you're going to read it, uh, I'll say that as, an, as, as the lead author. No, it's great stuff. It's in the repository. Um, so actually, you can see here there's a little grey padlock. So that's on payroll telling you that they can't find an open access version of it, which made me really sad because I know there is an open access version of it in the repository. So what we, what really you should have seen was something like this green padlock. Um, so when I search for it and I'm logged into to Raven and on the university network, it tells me there's an open access version because we have a subscription to the journal and so I can get it using, um, using my shibboleth access. And we call it Athens. That was, that was old. So these are a couple of tools. Um, I really like them and I think they're great things that you could promote to, to researchers in your college. And I think it's a really nice way of promoting green open access, which I'm a big fan of um, personally. And that I would like to see uh, kind of the future of open access being nice and green. So the I think the last thing I was going to talk to you about on the future of open access at Cambridge is the UK Scholarly Communications Licence. So I've called this kind of um, it's not necessarily the future of Cambridge actually, this is kind of the future across the UK, hence the title. So I'd like to admit now that I, um, I took uh, some information from my next couple of slides from Torsten Riemer's um, slides he gave uh, at a conference and I put the citation down there. Claire kind of gave me um, the evil eye saying, well I suppose some citation is better than no citation because I didn't cite it completely properly, but I'm sure you'll forgive me because it's quite a long citation. So the problem that the UK Scholarly Communication Licence is dealing with is that actually there are many conflicting open access policies. So there's the Hefke policy for REF, there can be funder policies, you could have multiple funder policies that your paper has to comply with. And they're all asking you to do different things. And on top of that, all the different publishers are doing different things and allowing you to do different things through different embargoes of your accepted version different gold options, and actually it's possible to make your paper open access in one sense, but still not comply with some of the open access policies. So the UK Scholarly Lic Communication Licence is really trying to cut through all this complexity and make it a lot more simple for researchers and institutions to make papers open access. Because actually the whole point of open access is not so that we can comply with funders policies, and, and you know, tick a box to say we're doing really well, but it's actually to increase the availability and accessibility of research that's out there. So the solution that's been come up by the UK Scholarly Communication Licence kind of steering committee is that, is that they uh, would like to introduce what's uh, like a Harvard style licence. So if anyone's familiar with Harvard and their um, their license publication licence that they have, it means that they the research institution or organisation can or has some level of control over all the publications produced by those researchers and they're allowed to do certain things with it. So the license would allow authors to make their uh, accepted manuscript publicly available. They can give it a CC license, uh, whichever one they choose, and they can also sub-license all authors and their host institutions. So if there was a multi-author paper with different institutions, each institution would be able to make the um, AEM publicly available. And no action is required by the author, which is why I've got this slight tenuous photo of someone with their feet up. Um, so actually they don't have to do anything. It, this license would just apply. They would still, of course, need to send us their accepted manuscript to the repository so we could uh, make it available. And the license is binding on publishers, provided they had previous knowledge. So there would be, um, and there is currently communication between the UK Scholarly um, Comms Licence Steering Committee and publishers talking about what happens if we introduced it. And once a publisher knows about it, they have to um, stick to the terms and conditions. And that is a legally binding thing. So things to note about the UK Scholarly Communications Licence is that it does not restrict academic freedom of where to publish. Um, some of the concerns about, about it going, oh, but you're going to tell me where to publish. Some, some publishers might not agree to this. 
So then I won't be able to publish there. But actually, authors can request a waiver for specific papers if the publisher um, asks them for it. So one example of that at the moment is the proceeding of the National Academy of Sciences, or PNAS. Um, for sure, and where they ask that if you have an institutional open access policy, that you must receive um, a waiver from that before you can publish in there. So we get a lot of researchers asking us, do, is, do they need a waiver from Cambridge at the moment? And we say, no, no, there's no institutional policy. But if we were interested to introduce something like the UK Scholarly Communications Licence, we'd then have to grant them a waiver if they wanted to publish in that journal. So the UK, UK SCL, I'm just going to go for short, uh, is really seen as a transitional solution until a more sustainable open access model emerges. So they, the steering committee don't see it as something that might last forever and ever, but they see it as a mechanism to help academics um, publish still and retain some rights over their papers, whilst the publishers can develop a new business model and they can make open access more sustainable. So. It kind of gives everyone a bit of room in order to change their practices and to to adapt to this kind of new age of open access that we find ourselves in. The publishers are not not so happy about the idea of the UK Scholarly Communication Licence. So I think it's the UK Publishing Association um, wrote a long response or letter to the UK Scholarly Communication Licence Steering Committee kind of laying out all of their concerns around this licence. And um, one of the members of the steering committee has written a set of responses. So the link you've got there is to a really nice summary of the concerns and the responses. So it's a, it's a nice table, kind of set in PowerPoint, that's nice and easy to read uh, if you don't have too much time to read the whole letter because it's quite lengthy. Um, so it kind of gives you a breakdown. And some of the main concerns of the publishers are things like well, it's just going to create more work for institutions because you're going to have to grant so many more waivers. Um, whereas the response is like, well, actually for Harvard, less than 5% of their papers have to ask for a waiver. So why is it going to be so very different for UK authors than it is for Harvard authors? Publishers also seem to talk about the governmental policy being a gold open access policy, whereas actually there is no one governmental policy. There's a hefty policy, there's the RCUK policy. They're trying to achieve different things and they have different requirements. So actually, there's... I mean, I'm on the UK Scholarly Communications Licence side. I'll admit it. <laughs> I'm biased. Um, so you can see that... There are arguments on, on both sides, but I think the way the publishers have framed it is, is not entirely accurate all of the time. So at Cambridge, um, you might be wondering if we're going to try and implement the UK SCL, because the idea was that it would try and be implemented at some point this year. But actually, the university's IP policy actually makes it really challenging to implement the UK SCL at the moment. It would, change, it would require some kind of changes to be made to the IP policy um, to separate our publications from, from other research kind of outputs or uh, intellectual property that our researchers come up with. So that, that's a big challenge and uh, we wait to see kind of how to progress with that. But we hope that other institutions will be adopting it and, and we'll see how how it goes for them and how the publishers react. So finally, I just thought I'd give you a few ways to keep kind of keep on top, keep afloat with all this information. So one of them is to subscribe to open access uh, hyphen info at list.cam.ac.uk. This is our internal Cambridge open access list. So if you're interested in getting some kind of open access um, updates about things that are going on in Cambridge. Um, for example, we just sent out um, an email about kind of service downtime, um, which will be happening on Friday and Monday. You can join that list. Uh, you might also want to follow some people on Twitter. So there we have our Cam Open Access account. Uh, but I would also highly recommend you follow Danny K68. So that's our boss, Danny Kingsley, uh, because she is wonderful at kind of stealing information from other people. And you might want to do a bit of reading in, in your spare time or over a cup of tea. Um, so you could read the UK Core blog. So UK Core is the UK Council of Research Repositories. So they are a group of uh, people working in open access, basically, in different institutions. Who uh, There's an emailing list and they write a blog. 
Um, they say that you should be directly involved in your institution's repository or work with it in some kind of way um, to, in order to get membership to their email list. So if you if you would like to be on their email list and you feel like you you have enough dealings with repositories, and um, just get in touch with them from their website ukcore.org and ask for membership. Uh, I've also put the LSE Impact blog on on the list. They deal with a huge range of scholarly communication topics and much more than just open access but actually I think their blog is great and it's one of my go-to sources for information so I'd really um, recommend that as, as a, just a source of information for scholarly communications in general. And there's also the LSE newsletter uh, so we send out monthly newsletters with updates about open access goings on and you can find the archive at their web link there and you should also be able to find a sign up page. So that's all I wanted to say, uh, just thanks for watching and listening. Um, if you have any questions you can contact us at info at openaccess.cam.ac.uk and we have uh, another webinar next week about open access for the humanities and social science librarians which will be focusing more on open access for monographs and you can sign up to it there. Um, there's time, oh, Claire will also be sending out, oh she has just sent out a link to the feedback form. So if you have any feedback about today's webinar, please let us know. We'd be especially interested to hear your views on the format as uh, we're trialling webinars at the moment. And if you have any questions, please type them into the, into the chat box. I'm happy to hang around for a bit and answer any questions you might have. Otherwise, thanks for listening.